and today's forum features three extremely distinguished gentlemen who are relatively new presidents of our local universities. Uh, Father William Beauchamp is president of the University of Portland. Colin Diver is president of Reed College. And Thomas Hostetler is president of Lewis and Clark College. The title of the presentation today is New Presidents, New Priorities, Taking Private Education to a Higher Degree. Now, if you'd be kind enough to turn off your cell phones or other noise-making devices, we would all appreciate it. And I know you can all hear me, and I can even hear me, and that is thanks so much to these nice speakers that have generously been contributed by Apple Music. I can't even tell you how grateful I am, because it usually sounded like mush up here. So thank you very much, Apple. Just a few brief announcements so that we can get to our interesting speakers. Our next Friday forum will also feature a very interesting speaker, and that's April 22nd, up on the fourth floor. And it's Vanessa Gaston, who is the president and CEO of the Urban League. So that should be very interesting. We haven't, uh, she hasn't been on our podium before. And I'd like to mention as well that we're in the middle of our spring membership drive, and this is your last opportunity to get in on a raffle for some complimentary tickets to Chamber Music Northwest and Portland Center Stage. So there are membership brochures on your table, or you can sign up at pdxcityclub.org. Now coming up this month, next week, is April, on April 18th, there's a new leaders mixer and meeting. All of these meetings, by the way, will be held over here in City Club Commons, so just take that for granted. So on April 18th, new leaders mixer and meeting. On April 21st, we'll have another of our post Illahi lectures to talk about Mil Bill McGibbon's April 19th Illahi lecture, Beyond Natural Resources, Creating a Truly Livable City. And on April 24th, please join other City Club members at a Sunday matinee of Fuente Ovejuna at Miracle Theater, which includes a post-play discussion with the director and the cast. Tickets are on sale at the City Club office. On April 25th, our Citizens Read reading group will be, a uh, book club discussion will be held at 7.15, and the book is Collapse, which was featured not very complimentarily in the Portland Tribune uh, about our choosing this subject. And uh, the Illahi president, Peter Sh Schoonmaker, Schoonmaker, will be acting as moderator. And on April 29th, we have our final Friday open house over here starting at 4.30. Just come and drop by and have a chance to chat with other City Club members and be sure to bring friends who might enjoy the City Club as well. Details on all of these events are available in your brochure or online, and you can also pick up um, audios or CDs and videotapes of today's program if you'd like. Now, I'd like to very much thank our sponsors this quarter. They help make these broadcasts possible. And the broadcast or the sponsors this quarter are Pope and Talbot, Providence Health Systems, and Zimmer Gunsel Frasca. So thank you very much to them. <laughs> Greatly appreciate it. Now, I was just telling these gentlemen on our panel that their CVs went for about a mile and a half because they're all so um, accomplished. So I will try to highlight them, and I probably won't do them justice. We'll start with the Reverend William Beauchamp, uh, who began at the University of Portland in 2002 as a senior vice president, and he became the 19th president in January of 2004. He is also a professor in the university's Robert B. Pamplin Jr. School of Business Administration. He was executive vice president at the University of Notre Dame from 1987 to 2000, where he supervised stunning growth in the university's endowment, supervised the construction and renovation of much of the campus, and supervised the university's renowned athletic program, which no doubt helped with the endowment. Uh, he earned his BS in accounting and his MBA degrees from the University of Detroit, and a law degree from Notre Dame in 1975. He taught accounting at Alma College in Michigan from 1967 to 72, and then practiced law for two years. After that, he entered the Moreau Seminary at Notre Dame and earned a Master of Divinity degree in 1981, and he was ordained as a priest in 1982. He also serves on the boards of two organizations that help provide funds for student education. 
Colin S. Diver became Reed's 14th president in July of 2002. Earlier in his career, he served as a dean at the University of Pennsylvania Law School, and during his tenure as dean, over $110 million in contributions were secured. Before coming to Penn, he was a member of the faculty at Boston University School of Law, and he has served as a visiting professor at the Kennedy School of Government at Harvard, and has held joint appointments in the public policy at Wharton School and Boston University School of Management. He received his BA degree, summa cum laude, from Amherst College, Amherst, and his LLB degree, magna cum laude, from the Harvard Law School. He had a brief stint in politics right after college, working as special counsel for Boston's mayor, Kevin White, and also served in the administration of Massachusetts Governor Francis Sargent. And last, and I won't say the obvious next phrase, Dr. Thomas Hostetler became Lewis and Clark College's 23rd president in August of 2004. He earned his Bachelor of Arts degree in history from Earlham College, his master's degree in history at the University of Michigan. After spending a year in Germany on a fellowship, he earned his PhD in history at the University of Michigan. He served as a teaching and research, research fellow in the Department of History at Stanford University then spent the next six years as a financial analyst, budget manager, and assistant director of finance at Stanford University Hospital, where he helped the hospital receive the second highest reimbursement rate of all medical facilities nationwide. He later became a senior associate and staff economist for Stanford's Office of Financial Planning. And he, prior to that, worked in uh, budgeting and finance capital campaigns at Bad Owen College, the University of Houston, and Rice University. And he was also instrumental in developing a liberal arts research university in Bremen, Germany. Uh, I believe that we're going to begin with Father Beauchamp, so please welcome our guest today. Thank you very much, and uh, good afternoon. It's great to be here. Uh, we've been asked to talk about uh, private higher education and more specifically how our individual institutions perhaps uh, the unique role that they play. And I thought what I would do is start by giving a, just a very brief introduction to the University of Portland. Uh, we are 104 years old, uh, founded in 1901 by the really combined effort of Archbishop Christie, who was Archbishop of, the, of Portland at the time, and Father John Zahm who was uh, provincial for the Holy Cross Order, of which I'm a member of. It, was, uh, it sits, as it always has, on a site on what we call the Bluff in North Portland. Uh, it's a site that, uh, William, uh, that uh, William Clark explored 200 years ago and made note from that site where he could see, wrote back to Thomas Jefferson, where he could see Mount Hood and Mount Jefferson. So we have a long history of people that have been involved in education, if you will, if you think of Lewis and Clark as I do, as great educators in our country. Our mission is really quite simple. Uh, we are obviously a university. But there's three terms that uh, we use uh, regularly. In fact, it's almost a mantra for the university when we talk about ourselves, and that is teaching, faith, and service. It is a university in the Holy Cross tradition. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm a member of the Holy Cross Order. We have five universities in this country, and we have served at the university as its president ever since 1902. It is, uh, it is in the liberal arts tradition with the uh, College of Arts and Science, plus four professional schools, School of Education, School of Business, School of uh, Nursing, and School of Engineering. 30% uh, of our students would come from Oregon. And we are represented uh, students from 42 states in the United States plus a number of foreign countries. And in fact, we have a specific program, a master's program in Guam on site. We are about 2,800 undergraduates and 400 graduate students. So we are what you'd call, uh, we'd call it what you would be classified rather as a, as a, a comprehensive uh, regional university. There are many uh, ways I think it's fair to say that uh, higher education, private higher education, helps make uh, Portland a great city. And it is a great city. I've been here three years and I'm loving every minute of living here. But I'm going to focus on what I think are just three areas that make the University of Portland's contribution somewhat unique. 
first one is partnerships with the city. The second one would be Catholicism, and the third one would be athletics and how that relates to character. First of all, uh, partnerships with the city, and I'm going to give some specific ones. For example, we have an important partnership with Providence, the Providence system, to provide solutions to the great nursing shortage crisis that we have in this country, and health care crisis. Um, so we have, as I said, a nursing school, but in alliance with the Providence Health System, we have a special program that enables students to come to the University of Portland, receive full scholarships, and then provide, obviously, the needed nursing staff for the, universe, for the Providence system. We have, obviously, we have a college, a school of business. Uh, one of the important parts of that uh, that is known nationally is the entrepreneurship program. That's one of the top programs in the country. We have an e-scholars program. We have been recognized in that regard for the entrepreneurship program. And in fact, we are starting to do some work with the OHSU in, this, in, the, art, in the entrepreneurship area. Obviously, we have an MBA. We have internships and consultants. Uh, research consultants from our faculty, so we believe very much in the partnership in the city. Ethics. I think ethics is another important area in partnership. Uh, we are first, for example, we are the only school in the country to offer a degree in environmental ethics and policy. Uh, from, so looking at the environmental issues in our country from an ethical perspective. And we also bring on a number of speakers and we have an ethics, a chair in ethics, uh, Dr. Peg Hogan, who's with us today. I suppose another way you could look at it is economic impact. What do we mean to the city in dollars and cents? It may be crass, but it is something that I think is important to the state and to the city. Uh, we just did, in fact, an economic impact study of the university because we were interested in that ourselves. We are located in North Portland, uh, which is uh, developing is probably in some ways one of the hottest uh, areas in town in development. But we strengthen, obviously, and stabilize the real estate values and livability in that area. But some specifics, we employ over 500 people and draw thousands of people to the campus for conferences, for athletic events, for graduations, for a number of other things. We've estimated, using the typical economic multipliers in that, that we add to the economy of this area about $150 million a year between employee salaries and direct expenses and what our students spend and visitors, et cetera. We also obviously have been involved in recent construction on the campus and we'll be doing uh, significantly more in the years ahead. As far as also impacting the city, we are a school with a lot of alumni in the area. More than 10,000 uh, University of Portland alumni live and work in the metropolitan area. Um, and, that, and if you take just all of Oregon and all of Washington, you add 4,000 to that. In fact, we have 1,000 of our graduates, our teachers in the state of Oregon. Uh, we have some renowned people uh, that are graduates that are current leaders in our community, such as the current mayor, Tom Potter, the current chief of police, Derek Foxworth, uh, people like Bob Pamplin Jr., Pat Becker, uh, Brenda Braxton, uh, uh, and uh, Tiffany Mulbrett, and Julianne Johnson, some of those names would be familiar with you. So that, I mean, just briefly, looks at some of the opportunities we have to work within the city. We also, I also said service was an important component of uh, what we are as a university. So we have, we're very actively involved with community service. The Blanche House of Hospitality was founded through the University of Portland, as well as the McDonald Center and the Downtown Chapel with Father Dick Berg that f flowed out of the University of Portland. We have such programs as PACE, which is an alliance to provide teachers for our Catholic schools, bridge builder programs, many of which you'd, you'd be familiar with, as well as just providing a cultural resource for the city, as, which is another important role of a university with the summer stock uh, Mox Crest Productions, uh, speakers like Jonathan Kozel and the Dalai Lama that have come to the campus, as well as other theater. The second area I mentioned was Catholicism. We are, uh, the University of Portland is the only on this panel of three of the only faith-based school on the panel. And in fact, it is the largest single religious denomination in the state, Catholicism. Uh, and when universities began in Europe, in the Middle Ages, they were all Catholic. Uh, that has certainly gone by the wayside, but there are currently 238 Catholic colleges and universities in the nation out of some 3,000 total colleges and universities. 
Um, we are the largest faith-based school in the city. So faith and the openness to discussion of faith issue, issues is a central part of our mission uh, and uh, something that we consider a vital part of our community life. Just yesterday, in fact, I was reading an article in uh, the Chronicle, and it talked about, uh, this was a national study done by UCLA, that talked about incoming freshmen at universities. And 70% of first-year students in this study say that they have beliefs, and these beliefs provide guidance, but they are doubting, they're seeking, and they are conflicted. Uh, and they, they want uh, at a university to discuss issues of life, the burning questions, uh, what is, uh, so in other words, in, in, in a component of that would obviously be spirituality. Um, that's something we've been doing for over 100 years at the University of Portland. Uh, that is not taboo. Spirituality is not taboo. It doesn't mean indoctrination, but it does mean that we believe very strongly as part of our mission is to discuss the great issues and, the, and what matters to people and, and young people as they prepare their life for the future. So faith is a very central component of who we are. We have such things as the Garaventa Center for Catholic Intellectual Life and American Culture. Uh, we have an Office of Volunteer Services that has provided more than provides, I should say, more than 11,000 hours of service annually in and around the city of Portland by our students. Um, I did mention we are Catholic, and I suppose just to explain that a little bit, some of you that may not be familiar, uh, we are an independent university. We are not run by the Catholic Church. We are not uh, supported by the Catholic Church. We are not part of the archdiocese. Uh, we were, as I said, founded by Archbishop Christie, with, and it's been a, a, an institution that has been administered and under the responsibility of the Holy Cross Order since its founding. Uh, so we are a place that welcomes all people. Uh, over about, proud, or I should say about 50% of our students would not be Catholic, but that is basically the core of what we are as an institution. Uh, Faith-oriented, faith-directed, faith-guided. Athletics. Uh, Maybe you think I bring up athletics just because I've been involved in it, it uh, as mentioned at Notre Dame before, but I happen to believe that athletics play a critical role, a key role, and can play. They don't have to, but they can play a critical role in an institution and what they are. The University of Portland is the only Division I private school in the city and the state. Uh, and, and I would say as a, as a Division I school, we would be small, clearly. But we believe that sports play a vital role in forming character. We believe that we can help restore sanity to college athletics because it's gotten, in many instances, a little out of control by emphasizing, first of all, that these are student athletes with the emphasis on students. Um, we take that very important. Uh, that's a very important component. Um, we are very proud of our athletic program and our student athletes. Last year, for example, Imani Dorsey and our soccer team was named the Oregon Woman of the Year by the NCAA. We've had Christine Sinclair, if any of you follow soccer, would be familiar with the, the winner of the Herman Trophy, which is the equivalent of Heisman Trophy for soccer, the best soccer player in the country, who will be returning to us next year as well, uh, is also a top student in biology. Um, we had Heather Dennison, who was a volleyball player, receive the NCAA Inspiration Award in 2004. So, that with All-Americans and academic All-Americans and the important thing of graduating and getting degrees, we think is uh, very important to us. And just a little plug, uh, those of you again who follow soccer know that our soccer teams are nationally ranked and internationally acknowledged. And tonight on campus, our women's team will be playing the Mexican national team. So we do play at a high level. Um, but as I said, we believe Athletics is something, if you're going to have it at the university, it should be part of the university. It should not be something that is extraneous to what you are, so we take it very seriously and we expect to excel in that, in the same way as we expect to excel in others. So in summary, we've been a part of Portland for over 100 years and are looking forward to strengthening our partnership during the next 100. Uh, and we're pleased that we make a unique contribution to our life in the community. Um, if I were to summarize, I would say that looking at it from a business perspective, our business is to help our students find and help them to focus their talents. The gifts that have been given them, the gifts that can be sharpened and wielded and 
so much that they can do for it to improve the life in our community. Um, we secondly, we believe that our business is to be a rich and fertile resource for Oregonians of all sorts. Um, and by this I mean far more than providing a, super, a superb education in, of the mind and the heart. I mean the services we provide also preparing young people to assume leadership positions in their community. And also our business is to be in a sense a remarkable and subtle center for venture creation. We're about ideas. That's what uh, universities in many ways are about. We are all about ideas. Not just the sharing of riveting ideas that have helped create and change the, and better the world to date, but ideas like democracy and free markets. But ideas also that have not yet been dreamed of. Uh, we also want our students when they graduate to have some idea of their responsibility. Uh, they aren't gonna know all the answers. They might think they do. But what's important to us is obviously that they're prepared well academically with, with the coursework and the degree, but also that they will know what questions they should be asking uh, as they prepare for their future life. So I invite you to come to the campus whenever you get a chance. We would love to have you. Thank you very much. Good afternoon. Welcome to the City Club's version of the three tenors. Um, <laughs> at the end of the uh, luncheon, the three of us are going to get up here and we are going to give you a rendition of Puccini's Nessun Dorma <laughs> that you will find unforgettable. <laughs> and I think it's a kind of appropriate anthem for a college president. president. Nessun Dorma means no one is sleeping and um, that characterizes not only our lives as presidents, but unfortunately the lives of all the thousands of undergraduates that we're responsible for. Uh, as uh, Corleen indicated, I came three years, almost three years, to uh, Reed College from the Eastern Establishment. Uh, I was quite happy and quite comfortable uh, in my position at the University of Pennsylvania. But when I heard about the uh, opening for the president of Reed College, I had to say I was extremely intrigued. And the more I looked at it, the more beguiled I became. It's not necessarily appreciated at home here in Portland as well as it should be. But Reed has a place in the imagination of educators and educated people that is really quite remarkable. And that place in the imagination is tied to a kind of notion of a classical sense of what it means to be a liberally educated human being. Uh, Reed is viewed, and indeed was viewed 3,000 miles away, uh, as the kind of perfect embodiment of a classical liberal education. Uh, it is a school dedicated entirely to the training of the formal intellect of academically talented undergraduates to building habits of rigorous analysis and disciplined inquiry, and to unleashing their creativity so that they can change the world, hopefully for a better, uh, in a better way. Uh, Reed is, a, is viewed, I think, appropriately as a school that treats undergraduates as though they were graduate students, as though they were apprentice scholars working hand in hand with master scholar teachers. So it is not surprising that a disproportionate number of them, about 60%, go on to graduate school. It is not surprising that uh, nationally Reed ranks among the top three or four undergraduate institutions every year in terms of future PhD productivity. It's not surprising that Reed is among the most honored uh, school in the country in terms of Rhodes Scholars and other competitive national awards. But this kind of school, the kind of school that Reed so well represents, gives rise to speculation about whether it really matters whether we, Reed, are in Portland and whether it matters to Portland whether we're located here. Um, it's very easy to view a school like Reed as an academic ivory tower, supremely isolated from its surroundings. It is perhaps easy to assume that Reed would be the same institution if it were located in a forest 
or in a cornfield or in a desert. Um, and it is perhaps also easy for many Portlanders to assume that the city would be the same city if the 110 acres occupied by Reed's campus was a residential subdivision um, or a commercial district. It would be easy to think this, but it would be wrong. It would be dead wrong. Being located in a city like Portland, indeed in this particular city, is I think an essential ingredient to the character of Reed College. And I would argue that um, it is an essential contributor to Portland's being what Portland is as well. Like Reed, Portland is a lively, creative, rebellious, contentious, sometimes rather edgy, slightly weird place. And we need each other. <laughs> the two institutions, the city of Portland, Reed College, are engaged and have been for a century in a kind of dynamic embrace, at once challenging each other and reinforcing each other. Well, there are several crucial ingredients of this embrace. First, Portland is a city that derives its energy from a steady influx of creative, educated, talented, imaginative people. And so is Reed. Reed is one of the great importers of talent into the city. Only about 7% of the students who come to Reed come from the state of Oregon. Only about 15% come from the Northwest. But over three times that many stay here or return after going to graduate school. And they bring with them uh, that kind of energy and that kind of questioning uh, exploratory spirit that it seems to me is so characteristic of Portland. Second, Portland is an intellectually vibrant city. It really is a city of thinkers, of readers, of debaters. Yes, a city of dreamers, we're told. And cities like that need intellectual centers. They need hothouses of inquiry and exploration and debate to help fuel that sense of intellectual exploration. And Reed certainly is one of those intellectual centers. Faculty and students do a great deal of research, and much of it is based in or about this community. We attract lecturers and speakers of national and international renown, and most of their lectures are made open to the public. And of course, our faculty share their expertise through lectures and seminars throughout the community. Third, Portland is a city of volunteers. It is a city that is committed to community service and social action. And Reed College is a font of community service, just as Father Beauchamp indicated is characteristic of the University of Portland. One of the lesser known things about our schools is how much we are in the community and how important that is, not only to the community, but to us. We offer some 28 outreach programs at Reed, most of them addressed to K through 12 school children. Last year, around 800 of our students, faculty, and staff devoted over 18,000 hours of voluntary time. And the college spent over $1.2 million on these programs, serving 2,500 children and adults in the Portland area. Fourth, Portland is a thriving cultural center, a hotbed of creativity in the visual and performing arts and in literature. And once again, Reed is an indispensable ingredient in that mix. The college sponsors and hosts concerts, plays, dance performances, and other cultural events too numerous and varied to list. Its gallery presents world-class exhibitions four times a year, bringing to the college great uh, distinguished artists and art commentators. Fifth, Portland is a city of great physical beauty with generous open spaces, parks, gardens, and woodlands to, re to, to relieve the intensity of traditional urban areas. The Reed College campus is an open space of uncommon beauty in an increasingly crowded corner of the city. Its grounds include a 26-acre conservation zone great rolling lawns, some majestic hundred-year-old trees. Countless neighbors use it as if it were a park, 
to jog, exercise their dogs, just enjoy the views. And finally, Portland is a city that reveres its history, even in its relative youth. Remember, I grew up in Boston. And that especially prizes stability and continuity amid inevitable change. Institutions like Reed, all of our institutions today, are truly custodians of the community's memory. We are carriers of the city's history. Unlike corporations that can shift their headquarters or that merge out of existence, colleges like ours are going to stay here. We are rooted in our locations and in our neighborhoods. If we are soundly managed, we will remain associated with Portland as long as there is a Portland. The private sector of higher education embraces a wide variety of institutions, each with its own mission and role. The virtue of the private sector is that it does not depend upon tax revenues. It does not need to conform to some prevailing political ethos or fashion. Its members establish their own independent, autonomous identities. And if they do it well, as I think all of our institutions have done, they become permanent features of their communities. So my ambition as the president of Reed College is not only to preserve and perfect the distinctive mission, the mission that Reed has pursued for 100 years, but as an essential part of that role to strengthen the relationship with the community that gave it its birth, that sustains it, and it in turn that we sustain. There are many in American education and in American society who question the value of liberal arts colleges and a liberal arts education. They view it, some of these critics, as obsolete, as dead, as an expensive luxury, as self-indulgent, as too expensive. And I think what we offer is an emphatic denial of that charge. What we embody and what we seek to um, preserve is the notion that um, a life worth li living and a community with people in it who are truly committed to supporting that community are going to continue to need the kind of education that we provide. Thank you. I want to begin by thanking the organizers of this event and for bringing us three together, the three tenors maybe we are. Um, my wife Marcia and two of our three sons came to Portland last summer from having spent five years in Germany uh, where we were engaged in helping to for found and uh, create the first private American style research university in Germany uh, to be established since the Middle Ages. Um, and that was really quite a challenge, um, and one that I think that we met quite well. Uh, coming to Portland and taking over the presidency of Lewis and Clark College has also been a challenge. I won't say how much of a challenge it's been, but when we arrived here, I had jet black hair. Um, <laughs> some of you know that's not true. But. I'd like to talk a little bit about Lewis and Clark, which is arguably one of the best kept secrets in American higher education today. Those of you who have grown up and lived and worked in Portland, of course, have a personal and firsthand knowledge of Lewis and Clark. Moreover, as I'm learning, uh, many potential students uh, from across the country and from around the world are beginning to learn about Lewis and Clark since the number of applications for admission has gone up mightily uh, in the last few years. This year, we will have over uh, 4,100 students applying uh, to come to our freshman class for next year. We will hope to have about 500 students uh, beginning, and in order to achieve that, we have admitted about 58% of the students. That makes us very nearly in the ranks of the highly selective uh, colleges uh, in this country, and we're, uh, and we're aiming to do even better in the future. All this is happening while at the same time those usual metrics of quality at undergraduate colleges, SAT scores, rank in class, number of valedictorians, and so on, are also beginning to climb, continuing to climb. Lewis and Clark is also not a secret in the academic world, and our searches for new faculty when we have vacancies 
uh, have attracted candidates from among the very finest graduate programs uh, around the country and around the world. All that being true, though, Lewis Clark and Clark remains largely unknown in what I might call the national consciousness, which is truly a shame. The college has been gaining in quality over the, the last two decades, so that we, I think, are a far better institution than our reputation uh, would suggest, both nationally and, I fear, sometimes locally. I think we share that a little bit sometimes with our, our sister college, Reed, across the river. Some elements of Lewis and Clark now are so old that they no longer seem newsworthy. The international focus of the college, for example, remains as strong and as vibrant today as it was 60 years ago when our first uh, uh, overseas studies programs were established. We still send some 60% of our students, undergraduate students, on an overseas experience in one of our 26 programs at some time during their careers. 44 different countries are represented within our undergraduate body of 1,800 students. Our interdisciplinary major in international affairs is not only one of our most popular majors, but it is also a springboard for students into international careers in law and public service uh, and in business and health care. In fact, it was the College's strength in international education that attracted me first to Lewis and Clark in the first place. And I'm immodest enough to think that I was uh, attractive as uh, an expert in international education, uh, as an attractive, so that they finally invited me to come and be their president. In another area, Lewis and Clark has become a national leader in environmental education, and our undergraduate major in this area is the model for many similar programs at other colleges and universities around the country. The Lewis and Clark Law School's program in environmental law is currently ranked number one in the country by U.S. News and World Report, one example of a great Lewis and Clark program that has won national recognition. In still another area, a recent peer review of our biology department, just to cite one other example, resulted in the verdict that our offerings in the life sciences put us among the top 20 or 25 departments among liberal art colleges and universities in the nation. That's within the top 5% or so in terms of both teaching and research. Undergraduate research at Lewis and Clark in the life and physical sciences has become second nature to our students, and every year dozens of our students co-author scholarly papers in peer-reviewed journals along with their professors, and I could go on and on. We have a great story to tell. As for the future, it is my intention as the new president of Lewis and Clark College to encourage the faculty to go with their strengths. I have mentioned some of those strengths already, international education and environmental studies. There are many other steeples of excellence out on Palatine Hill that I could name. The wave of the future for undergraduate education, though, lies in the places where the disciplines meet, in interdisciplinary education, and particularly interdisciplinary education that has a strong element of original research that engages students in real-time discovery. We at Lewis and Clark are very much at the forefront in developing these new modalities of teaching and learning for our students, many of which take advantage of recent technological advances for storing and manipulating information in all of its many forms. We're also very interested in partnering with other institutions in this regard, both here in Portland and around the world, uh, when it serves the mission, our mission of teaching and scholarship to do so. So what does all of this mean? And in what days, ways does the rise in the rankings of Lewis and Clark or of Reed or the University of Portland, for that matter, in any way affect our community and state? Well, in some very immediate ways that we've already heard about today, attracting and educating gifted and motivated students from outside of our city and state, as well as from within our national, our local community, and then sending them back out into the workforce in our region and that provides a tremendous boost to the intellectual capital that undergirds the economic life of the city and of the whole Pacific Northwest. The University of Portland and Lewis and Clark College both provide excellent programs in teacher education, for example, through our professional schools of education. We at Lewis and Clark have developed programs in educational leadership 
that focus attention and energy on helping principals and superintendents statewide to network with each other and to learn from each other in improving K-12 education. Needless to say, the Lewis and Clark Law School is a tremendous practical resource for our community, not only as a training ground for the legal professions, but also through such initiatives as the National Crime Victim Law Institute and the Kitzhaber Center, focusing public attention on legal issues with regard to natural resources, just to name two examples. In closing, I want to address one other aspect of Lewis and Clark that I find very appealing, and that is the genuine care and consideration that the faculty, students, and staff have, as a rule, for what I might term the common good. I reject categorically the characterization of Lewis and Clark as a refuge for pot-smoking, tree-hugging uh, students and, uh, and other kinds of malcontents. I read the security incident reports and I know that our drug problem, a minor one at Lewis and Clark, is, is far less than at other institutions where I have worked. And I can honestly say that in my eight months at Lewis and Clark, I do not recall having seen a single student wearing a pair of Birkenstocks. They may have worn them, but I don't recall having seen them. I also reject the second place ranking of Lewis and Clark College in a recent Princeton review among schools where the students are least likely to be concerned with the existence of God. The first place ranking in that category went to Reed College. <laughs> They, they always try to one-up us. I, di I did not see the University of Portland on that list, so I don't think Father Beauchamp. <laughs> but I would like to note that in a more recent Princeton review uh, conducted in, a, uh, in conjunction with the Campus Compact, Lewis and Clark has now been designated as one of 88 colleges of conscience uh, in the United States. Um, the only other institution in this region that has also won that title is Portland State University. This, distinguishing, this distinction uh, shows the degree of our faculty and students and staff in community outreach. Uh, we almost equal read in terms of the number of hours that our students, faculty, and staff, in fact, I think we need to go back and look at those numbers because I had only 17,000 hours of outreach on my, uh, in my information. Uh, so that's something else that Reed is always trying to do better than us. But our students are at work with the homeless in Dignity Village, the Oregon Food Bank, the Ronald McDonald House, uh, the Common Cup Family Shelter, working with disadvantaged students and uh, in legal aid societies around the city. We may be tree, tree huggers, but I think that our institution is one of those places that values giving back to its community, this community that has spawned and nurtured it, and I am proud to be its president. Let me say as a postscript, uh, that I think of Portland as being what the Germans would, would term a, a uh, Wissenschaftsstandort. That's a very uh, highfalutin word that means it's a place, a city, that has a, a great deal to offer in terms of scholarship and teaching. The notion that the private colleges in Portland, of which we three are representatives, are in some way competing, I have to say is completely false. Um, it is, in my opinion, also the case that we are not competing with the fine public institutions of this city uh, for funding, for public resources, for private donor support, or for students. There are rivalries, to be sure, but the rising tide of reputation and quality for any one of our colleges and universities, public or private, bears all other colleges and universities with it and makes our community all the more attractive as a place where education is valued and seen to be valued. That, I would contend, is good news for all of us, whether we're in education or business, in health care, in research, in the service industries or manufacturing, or in public service. Portland is a superb venue for higher education, and I, for one, am most pleased to have landed in a city that so generously supports its colleges and universities. Thank you for your attention. As could be expected, that was very educational.
Sounds like a, a healthy rivalry, but I think they each hold their own unique place in Portland. Uh, it is now time for our question and answer session. We have microphones on either side here, and please direct your questions in 30 seconds or less to one or more of our panel. Our board host today, who has the privilege of asking the first question, is Susan Hammer, and she's a member of the Board of Governors, um, Portland attorney, mediator, and arbitrator, focusing on business and employment issues. She is a fellow in the International Academy of Mediators and has served as vice chair as the board of trustee for Willamette University. Susan, first question, please. Thank you, Corlaine. Um, some 15 years or so ago, uh, a commission was established. Uh, it was called the Governor's Commission on Higher Education in the Portland metropolitan area. It later became the Portland Trust in Higher Education, and it produced a report called the Frisbee Report, named after our chair, Don Frisbee, at the time. In that report, it was envisioned that uh, it's someday in Portland we could have a system of higher education where the whole was greater than the sum of the parts, that we would not not only have a healthy rivalry, but we'd actually have uh, cooperation between our colleges and universities so that we could have such things as uh, joint faculty appointments, student access to classes and opportunities at sister institutions, joint purchasing, and other sorts of things. Um, my question is really for any or all of you that want to comment on this, but what I'm wondering is, have we made any progress at all in this direction, and are there ways in which the students and uh, faculty and or faculty in your institutions are enriched by their association with other uh, institutions in Portland? Thank you. Um, let me try and I'd be, I'd be happy to share the podium on, on answering this, but I would say the answer is emphatically yes, we've made a lot of progress. Um, first of all, there are a number of ways in which we collaborate on um, uh, sort of infrastructure issues, purchasing. We have a health insurance trust that, ha that provides many of us with uh, the employees of these colleges with health insurance. Uh, our libraries have uh, led the way with uh, spectacular collaboration uh, that encompasses now, I think, just about all of the academic libraries in the Pacific Northwest so that our students have uh, access uh, within 24-hour delivery to 22 million volumes um, you know, throughout the region. Uh, so on that score, we're doing, we're doing great. Uh, in terms of uh, academic cooperation, that's more difficult. We do have uh, plenty of Reed students who take Japanese at Lewis and Clark and um, who also take courses at Portland State University, so there's certainly a fair amount of that. Um, and I know that faculty collaborate in a number of individual ways. Um, our, the new director of our art gallery is uh, developing a collaborative um, uh, uh, exhibition with her counterparts uh, at comparable institutions around the, the, the city. So it seems to me while we still have a long way to go, we're making great progress. Uh, I would agree. Uh, there are also many co-curricular and extracurricular activities that go on. We regularly advertise the, uh, the uh, concerts and the lecture series at the other institutions around the city, uh, and we're very glad that, uh, to welcome other uh, individuals from other colleges, as well as the general public, to Lewis and Clark to any events that we might have. Uh, but I do agree that there's a great deal more that might be done uh, in areas where we do have um, we do have a coincidence of interests. It does make a lot of sense, I think, to share resources, to begin to do some planning so that we don't duplicate. To the extent that the missions of the different in institutions are somewhat different, that makes it very difficult uh, because we have to serve, first of all, of course, the, the needs of our students and, and of our service area. Um, but in those instances, in those cases where it is possible for us to share and to collaborate, I think it's always in our interests uh, to do so. Yeah, I would concur with that, uh, kind of, I guess, starting with the negative side to begin with. Uh, there is the problem with the different, somewhat different mission of the different institutions, which, which uh, and, and also colleges and universities take great pride in their independence and, uh, and autonomy from each other to a certain extent. Sometimes it's healthy, sometimes it's not. Uh, but I, I, there, is, there is the opportunity for collaboration, and I think just beginning among the presidents. I mean, we do know each other, and we do on occasion get together. I also mentioned we, for example, have this program in entrepreneurship that we're working with OHSU. So I think among the, 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 uh, the 
institutions of higher learning in this uh, area. I think there is an opportunity and a desire to have more and more cooperation with each other within the realm of po uh, the various possibilities that exist. Thank you for coming. Bonnie G. Yosek, City Club member. I think that uh, you all mentioned the fact that all of your institutions bring great, bright students to the region um, and provide them with excellent educations and then send them out into the world. All that's absolutely true. Among the people with whom I'm acquainted, uh, a lot of the people have gone elsewhere for their educations, undergraduate and graduate, and then moved here for other reasons, either because they're natives like myself or simply lifestyle or other choices. And one of the frustrations that I think we see is that there isn't the uh, wealth of uh, other lectures and so forth. And I know that while there are great lectures that are open to the public, I'm wondering how you might uh, encourage um, and the fact that the resources of the institutions are here, how you might sort of encourage that sort of uh, uh, additional intellectual curiosity among the general public, besides through lecture series and other things like that. I'd just like to hear your thoughts on that. Thank you. <laughs> well, you can lead a horse to water. Um, we do everything that we can uh, to make known to the public uh, those, those events on our campus that are open. Uh, it's frequently the case that uh, there's a collision. One of the wonderful things about our, not just our campus, but this city certainly as a whole, is that there's so many things going on that uh, being able to get to all of the concerts and all of the lectures and to attend all of the, uh, the events is, is a virtual impossibility. Um, there's also an issue of, of venue. Um, if we do put on, a, on an event, uh, we're all constrained by the size of our facilities uh, and bringing everyone onto campus uh, and finding parking and all of those kinds of things for people is not always that easy. Uh, but to the extent that we have the facilities and we have the resources, we, we heartily encourage. Uh, and I think we do a pretty good job of getting the word out. Uh, it is a matter of people reading in the paper and seeing what's, what's there. In addition, I think we all have a responsibility to even do a better job of it on our own campuses with our students and faculty and staff on our own campuses to get them even more aware and excited about the things that are going on. Uh, I mean, clearly the, the, the student body does, but I think we could even do a better job than we do in starting right in our own backyards. In terms of uh, building, um, whether for a new building or for additions, you are considering a great architect. And the basis of my question would be, a great city deserves great architecture. Well, I, I might uh, try to respond to that. We are dedicating, uh, a week from today, a brand new building on our campus, uh, the John R. Howard Hall, which is our new social science center. Um, I think it is an architecturally distinguished building. It has already won awards for its environmental uh, awareness. Um, um, if you, I invite you to visit that building, you will see that it is an extraordinarily flexible building. Um, many of the materials that were used in that building are recycled. All of the steel is recycled steel. Most of the, uh, the brickwork and the, the blocks that, that go into making that building uh, have been recycled. The floors are recycled glass. Um, to the extent that uh, good architecture means uh, environmentally sound architecture, I think we're doing a good job in that regard. Uh, I think the other architecture on all of our campuses is really quite distinguished, as well as being serviceable. I guess I would uh, hesitate to um, speak too candidly about this because there are representatives of our architectural firm in the audience. <laughs> no, actually, I'm very proud of the architecture that, uh, that the ZGS firm has uh, designed in, in recent years uh, at Reed, uh, and it's a long legacy. Uh, going back to A.E. Doyle, who designed the original buildings, uh, Pietro Beluski, we have had uh, first-rate architects at Reed, and we intend to continue to do that. Yeah. 
I'll uh, defer to the congressman from Oregon. <laughs> so, hey, please, uh, 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 taking turns is something we should learn early in life, please. <laughs> Mike Dennis, City Club member. I, um, it's no surprise that housing costs are rising all across the country and on the West Coast and in Oregon in particular. How is this affecting students, many of whom live off campus, and what strategies are you using to deal with that? I think also you have, it's not just an issue for students, it's an issue for faculty, uh, bringing faculty in. One of the things we have done at the University of Portland from the faculty perspective, is we established an opportunity for them to get low cost loans that we will help, help them with, uh, especially if they buy homes within the North Portland area, uh, to encourage them to come and live in that area, which also helps the neighborhood and helps develop uh, the, uh, the uh, cost of housing and that. As far as students are concerned, we, um, it's in a variety of different ways. One, we own a number of uh, houses that we rent to students, but we primarily at the uh, University of Portland want to be uh, our students living on campus. We want to increase the number of them living in residence halls. We're about 60%, a little over 60% right on campus. We want to increase that to 75% over the next few years. So that's one way we, we, we consider ourselves very much a residential school. Yeah, our, our profile is almost identical. We have now gotten up to housing 65% of our students. Our goal is 75%. And we are buying little houses adjacent to campus and making them available for new faculty to uh, at least rent when they first arrive. But it is a concern. Um, and it's a concern that it's, it's going to take money for us to solve. I would address also the issue of, of faculty. We, we also are striving to house as many of our undergraduate students, our graduate students in law and in education. Um, uh, that is a serious issue for them. Uh, but as a residential college, one of the things that concerns me is the degree to which faculty and staff are uh, less and less able to live near the college. Um, and I don't know how that can, uh, that can be resolved, but it uh, changes the character of the college when, when uh, faculty and staff can't quickly come to events in the evening. Uh, and so we have to find a way to address that. Uh, David Wood, City Club member. First, um, I just want to say with a touch of envy what fabulous public speakers all three of you are. Uh, and also in my day job, uh, I look forward to working with each of you in the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act, should that ever happen. Um, and my question, third, is for Father Beauchamp. And President Beauchamp, I'm asking this of you only because you are here and I've never been able to ask this of anyone else. And this is about not, not academics, but about athletics. And as you mentioned, the connection between athletics and character. And this is really about your prior position at Notre Dame. Um, as a proud Stanford alumnus, uh, I was brokenhearted when Notre Dame recruited Tyrone Willingham to coach Notre Dame's football team. Now, uh, he had a magical first season. He had a couple of tough <laughs> seasons. And I recall that he was let go after his third season of a five-year contract. And my understanding is that that's the first time that Notre Dame University has ever let go of a coach uh, in the middle of a contract. As a Stanford fan, a Red Sox fan, a Rams fan, I had to suffer years, if not decades, of bad teams. Wouldn't have been good for the Catholic character to have either suffered two years more of bad teams or, or to realize that even the best of coaches, like Bobby Bowden or Joe Paterno, have occasional bad seasons. <laughs> I think, uh, I don't know where that question is coming from. He's disappointed that he left Stanford. Uh, or uh, he wanted to continue the record that uh, Stanford with under Willingham was easily beat, beating Notre Dame. So, uh, I, I mean, I think, I, I guess it, to answer in general terms, I don't want to get into the specifics of Notre Dame. I wasn't involved in it uh, with that decision. I do think there is a, uh, I think there's over concern in uh, college athletics today, especially at the high profile college athletics programs, win and law, win and wins and win at uh, any cost. Uh, I do know, I mean, with Willingham, they, they did not, I mean, under his contract, they certainly fulfilled all of his contract and, and that uh, with what the terms were when he originally started. But it certainly, uh, you know, there was a lot, of, a lot of public attention paid to that and it and it's kind of sent a message that uh, I wasn't totally comfortable with as uh, somebody who was at Notre Dame. Uh, I still obviously have great respect for the institution and its program. But I think we, we what bothers me more even than that is, um, 
the whole sense that, uh, that uh, athletics is something, uh, too many institutions, that is totally independent from the rest of the institution. There's no, you know, you, you look at their athletic program and, and the people who are participating in it, and it, act, it operates totally independent of the institution. I remember there was a uh, university president, and I won't say where, who made the great statement, he, we wanted his university to be something that his football team would respect. Um, <laughs> that seemed to have it backwards. Uh, so uh, I think we have a big concern in that. I think the NCAA has made some great strides in that regard uh, in terms of uh, accountability for graduating our student athletes. Uh, but we've got a long ways to go in, in uh, especially high profile programs where, where it, it runs the institution more than it should. We're at the end of our regularly scheduled period uh, for our radio audience. Are you gentlemen able to stay on a few more minutes and answer some more questions?